welcome back to another lecture video on neurophysiology and tonight we're going to talk about cerebellar function of motor control. So just a quick um, looking back on the lectures that we already had. So we have here the motor system and it shows us the cerebral cortex and the motor command it gives to the spinal motor centers which then um, innervates our muscles and makes specific movements. We also have a feedback mechanism wherein um, this will help us perfect the movement or make it more um, accurate in nature. As well as there are different command monitors represented by these blue dotted lines and a corrective motor command. So we can see here the cerebellum and what will be the function of the cerebellum in motor control. So the cerebellum is responsive for coordinating muscle activity. And um, the cerebellum is frequently frequently um, described as like a very good friend who makes uh, who, who corrects you uh, if your actions are not correct. So they do not humiliate you or discourage you but help you perfect what you want to do. So parang ganun yung cerebellum. He's like a very good friend na kinokorek ka, di ba? Pag sinabi natin good friend, it's someone that stabs you in the front, not stabs you in the back. So the cerebellum is like the best friend of our motor command we're in. Uh, it corrects whatever is um, inaccurate in the movement or how to perfect the movement. Yun ang ginagawa ng cerebellum. That is what the cerebellum does. So it coordinates muscle activity. Remember, if there is no coordination, then uh, the movement will not be done in such a way that we want it. Like, for example, if you want to shoot a ball, if there is no coordination in the movement of the upper extremities with that of the lower extremities and that of the center portion of the body, then we will not be able to uh, uh, or we will not be able to shoot that ball or whoever is the one trying to do that. So you my basketball player, they really, it's really important for them to have their cerebellum, um, intact in order for this to be able to coordinate their activities. Um, second, it also sequences the motor activity. So the correct sequences has to be, um, put into motion in order for us to achieve a perfect shot. So it monitors and makes corrective adjustment in the activities initiated by other parts of the brain. So for example, if you know someone who really plays very good in basketball, halimbawa si Stephen Curry, di ba? So kukundi lang kasi alam kong basketball player. So ibig sabihin, uh, when he does that, syempre mayroon siyang constant practice na ginagawa. And because of the constant practice that he is doing, nagkakaroon ng proper coordination of the movement and correct sequencing. Therefore, pag shinoot niya, di ba? Ma, ma, a achieve niya talaga yung perfect na three points. Okay, so, uh, the cerebellum, they, they compare the actual motor movement with what is intended. And it makes corrective changes. So, most cerebral cortical motions are pendular. Therefore, there is in inertia and momentum. So, in order for you to move a limb accurately, it must be accelerated and decelerated in the right sequence. So that has been explained also. It calculates momentum and inertia and initiates acceleration and braking activity. So this is the cerebellum. It is located inferior to that of the cortex. Now, we have different parts of the cerebellum. Um, we, we have here the vestibulo cerebellum on this portion. So, it controls balance and eye movement. So, we will be explaining what is vestibulo cerebellum. So, what we need to know right now is it will control balance and eye movement. Of course, if you're trying to look at something and um, it will help you maintain your balance as well. Kaya, dalawa yan, they go together, balance and eye movement. I remember uh, one of our teachers in med school before asked us, what are the different areas involved for balance? Uh, we thought it's just the vestibular system, but actually even uh, that of the spine, uh, the eyes, and of course even the ears are involved. And of course the brain are involved for balancing the body. We also have ponto cerebellum. So the pons, diba? Ponto, pons, and the cerebellum, it is responsible for planning and initiation of movement. 
And spinal cerebellum on this portion we have here, it controls synergy. When we talk about synergy, it controls the rate, force, range, and direction of movement. So that is what we mean when we say the word synergy. So on this next slide, we can see here this picture showing us the location of the cerebellum. So it is located at the base of the brain as shown in this picture with a large mass of the cerebral cortex that is located above. So this is the cerebral cortex. And um, the brain stem is located anterior to that of the cerebellum. And the portion of the brain stem, which is the pons, is what is directly in front of the cerebellum. And it is this uh, cerebellum is separated from its underlying structures, um, from its or sorry, it's separated from the overlying cerebrum by a layer of uh, dura matter. It's a very tough dura matter, and all of its connection with other parts of the brain travels through the pons. Kasi makikita natin the pons is directly located in front of the cerebellum. So in this picture, we can see the anterior lobe here at this portion and posteriorly, or we also call this the middle lobe. And at the central portion, this is what we call the vermis. So moving on, we have here the different uh, relationship of the cerebellum to other parts of the brain. So the anatomist classifies the cerebellum as part of the metencephalon. Okay, part of the metencephalon, it includes the pons. So the metencephalon includes the pons. Uh, and the metencephalon, in turn, is part of the upper part of the rhombencephalon, or what we call the hindbrain. So the cerebellum is also divided into two hemispheres. But uh, let's try to look at the different structures that are located um, proximal to the cerebellum. So we have here the pineal gland, the mammillary body, we have the cerebellar, cere cerebral peduncle, the points, which we mentioned is, which is directly located anterior to that of the cerebellum, and the medulla oblongata here. So, um, makikita po natin, we can see here the pathway of the cerebrospinal fluid. So, we have here the central canal of the spinal cord. So, this portion which is located posterior of the pons is called the cerebellum. And there are different um, things that we would like to look at. So it has also a cerebra cerebellar cortex or what we call the gray matter. We have here foli folia and the white matter or we call that the arbor vitae. So these are the different parts of the cere cerebellum that we ought to know. So on this slide, we can see here uh, on gross inspection, uh, there are three lobes that can be distinguished in the cerebellum. So there are three lobes. So we have here, again, as we mentioned earlier, the flo flocculonodular lobe. So we'll just try to appreciate its anatomy, the flocculonodular lobe. And on the anterior portion, a, a percentage of the anterior portion, we have here the anterior lobe. And the green portion is what we call the posterior lobe. So there is there are feature fissures dividing the, each of the lobes. So between the anterior and posterior lobe, we call that your primary fissure. Well, um, in the posterior lobe, there is a horizontal fissure which um, divides the posterior lobe into an anterior and posterior portion. And we have a posterior fissure that div um separates the posterior lobe with that of the flocculonodular lobe. So here we can also see at this portion, um, it can be further divided in a midline. So the midline will be called the vermis. This portion is the cerebellar vermis, while uh, the lateral portion we call that your cerebellar hemispheres or lateral cerebellar hemispheres. Okay, so... Here we can see the functional organization of the cerebellum. So it is functionally arranged into longitudinal axis. So earlier we have seen the ana anatomy of the cerebellum, but, but this time we're going to take a look at the functional organization. So what is located in the center, as mentioned earlier, we call that your vermis, and it controls axial movements of the neck, okay? shoulder and the hip so axial movement what is located at the center portion of the body so that is the vermis now um 
we have what we call your intermediate zone. Okay, your intermediate zone are, uh, is also uh, for the control of motion of the distal portions of the upper and lower limbs. So the distal limbs, especially the hand and the feet. While the lateral zone, as we can see here, lateral zone of the hemisphere will control the sequencing of movements of the muscle and it is important for timing and coordination. So that is how we're going to organize the cerebellum physiologically. So the vermis, the intermediate zone, and the lateral hemisphere. So I want you to remember what is being controlled by these different parts of the cerebellum. Now, there are different pathways to the cerebellum. So when we say um, afferent pathways to the cerebellum, we have pathways coming from the brain. So again, as I've mentioned earlier, when you're trying to understand the different pathways, you just have to look for the root words. So when you say cortico, it comes from the cortex. So what portion of the cortex? So we have here the motor area, the motor cortex, the premotor area, and the somatosensory cortex. So these are all parts of the cortex, so cortico. And then we have here ponto cerebella. Remember, we've mentioned er earlier, everything that goes to the cerebellum will pass through the pons. So ponto cerebellar pathway. So from the cortex passing through the pons to the cerebellum. So some uh, pontine nuclei which will join this tract. So they project mostly to the lateral hemisphere area. So, so you can see on this diagram, we have here in the cortex, portion of the cortex, so this is where it will start, corticopontine tracts going to the pontine nuclei at the pond. So corticopontine. When we say corticopontocerebellar, this then um, is a pathway that goes to the cerebellum and as mentioned here it is the lateral portion where this uh, track is mostly projected so we call this the cortico ponto cerebellar track okay so another pathway for uh for afferent pathway to the cerebellum which is from the brain we call this the vestibulo cerebellar track so from the keywords or from the root words vestibulo so it receives vestibular and visual information. And we say vestibular, it is involved for balance. So the reflexes for balance and eye movements are being controlled here. So we can see here from the vestibular apparatus, the pathway then goes to the cerebellum. So this is the representing the cerebellum. So the pathway from the vestibular apparatus going to that of the cerebellum. Now, the next track or afferent pathway, we call this the reticulocerebellar track. So it is a formation, formation about the intended movement modified from other ex structures, example, from the limbic system. So in reticulocerebellar, these fibers originate at various levels of the reticular formation and they mainly terminate at the vermis. Remember, the vermis is located at the central portion and it controls movements of the actual portion of the body such as that of the neck, shoulders, and hips. So if we go back here on this uh, slide, we can see here um, that from the cerebral cortex, there are different motor command, uh, direct and indirect, going to the spinal motor centers which then stimulates the muscle to produce as, uh, an intended movement or a voluntary movement. And the receptors, the muscle spindle and Golgi tendon, will perceive the length adjustment and the tension in the tendon and will relay it to the spinal relay nuclei of the spinal cord. And then it will reach the um, spinocerebellum area. So once it reaches the spinocerebellum area, this will then send corrective command to the red nucleus or to the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, it goes back to the cerebral cortex. Then from the cerebral cortex, it will then uh, send signals to correct the movement, that specific movement. Okay? So, now, um, there are also afferent pathways to the cerebellum that comes from the periphery, from the peripheral area or the dorsal area. So, we call this the dorsal area 
spinocerebellar tract. So dorsal, it means posterior. And spino means it co is coming from the spinal cord, going to the cerebellum. So it is from the periphery. So this will transmit information from the muscle spindles. Okay, these are the receptors. And from the Golgi tendon organ and other receptors such as large tactile and joint receptors. So here... This is also known as the flesh sig fasciculus, and um, this pathway conveys proprioceptive information from proprioceptors in the skeletal muscle and even in the joints going to the cerebellum. So it is a part of the somato somatosensory system and runs in parallel with the ventral spinocerebellar cerebe tract. Now, what does it apprise the brain of? So it will tell the brain the momentary status of the muscle contraction, muscle tension, and limb position, and forces acting on the body surface. So it is for senses. So it will give us, or it will give the cerebellum what are the sensory, um, what are the sensory information coming from the muscles and the tendon. So it is an uncrossed track. So as we can see here, when we say it is an uncrossed track, meaning it does not go or cross over to the other portion of the body. So if it arises from the left part of the body, then the pathway will uh, have its um, ipsilateral portion going to that of the cerebellum. So it will not cross the tract. It will not cross over unlike that of the ventral spinocerebellar tract. So we can see here for the ventral spinocerebellar tract, these are signals from the anterior horn and interneurons. Uh, these are integrated signal from the final common pathway before it goes to the muscle. So these are your ventral spinocerebellar tract. They convey proprioceptive information from the body to the cerebellum. Now, this is known as uh, the goer's column. So ang tawag naman natin dito ay goer's column. So it is a part of the somatosensory system and, and it runs in parallel with that of the dorsal spinocerebellar tract as we have mentioned earlier. Um, these tracks, both the dorsal and ventral, are involved in um, uh, these tracks, uh, both of them, the dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tracks, involve two neurons. So the ventral spinocerebellar tract will cross the opposite side of the body first in the spinal cord as part of the anterior white commissure and then cross again to end in the cerebellum. So that's why we term it double cross. So from this portion, as we can see here, the blue line represents our ventral spinocerebellar tract. So at the level of the spinal cord, it crosses over to the contralateral side. So if it comes from the left, it will cross over to the right. And once it goes to the, before it reaches the cerebellum, it will again cross back to the other side. So we call that the double cross or... um. Yung, um, ito, ito nga yung sinasabi natin na it will cross to the opposite side of the body at the level of the spinal cord, but then it cross again to end in the cerebellum. So this is the ventral spinocerebellar tract. So on this slide, we can see here um, the different pathways and the different corrective feedback. So this represents the motor areas of the cerebral cortex. So this red um, pathway is an afferent pathway coming from the brain. So it passes through the thalamus, passes through the pons. So we call this the corticopontine tract. And then if it goes to the cerebellum, then we call this the corticopontocerebellar tract. Okay, so uh, we have here uh, the different motor centers in the brain stem represented by this structure. We have the pons and the pontine nuclei. And this is the direct pathway, meaning corticospinal tract. So this blue uh, line represents signals to lower motor neurons. And there are also sensory signals from proprioceptors in muscles and joints going to the vestibular apparatus and eyes. So 
we can see here the cerebellum, there are corrective feedback mechanisms, which is represented by the green arrow. It passes through the motor centers in the brainstem and then all as well as to the thalamus and it goes back to the cortex, giving uh, the cortex um, corrective uh, action on the intended movement. So therefore, magkakaroon tayo ulit ng, ng electric signal. Okay, from the cortex down to the spinal cord in order for us to be able to do the correct movement. Okay, so here on the next slide, okay, we have here the afferent pathways from the cerebellum. So earlier we discussed the afferent pathways. Now we discussed the afferent pathways. Now remember, all afferent goes out from the deep cerebellar nuclei. So from uh, we have here the cerebellar nuclei, and there are um, the these deep cerebellar nuclei are the dentate, emboliform. So we have here the dentate, emboliform, globus, and fastigius. So these are the deep cerebellar nuclei, and we're going to discuss uh, individually the different afferent pathways starting off with that coming from the vermis so the vermis is the central portion right so we are looking at this um diagram as if this is on one hemisphere only so this is the center portion the vermis so we have what we call your fastigio reticular tract and from cerebellar cortex directly to the lateral vestibular nuclei so we can see here um the vermis and then it passes through fastigius, which is a deep cerebellar nuclei. Kaya tawag natin siya kanya fastigio reticular tract. So from the fastigius, it passes through the vestibular nuclei, the lateral vestibular nuclei. And then it goes down to the motor neurons and then to the muscles. So we call this the fastigio reticular tract. So what is the function of this fastigio reticular tract? It is for equilibrium control. Remember, it passes through the lateral vestibular nucleus, which is responsible for equilibrium control. Next, we have coming from the intermediate zone, we have here this layer. This is the intermediate zone. We call it your interpositorubral fine voluntary movements of distal muscles. So um, here, we have here a cerebellar nuclei called interpositus, which is the globus and emboliform. So from the intermediate, it passes through this deep cerebellar nuclei and it passes to the red nucleus. Kaya ang tawag natin, interposito rubral. Remember, rubra, rubral means red nucleus. So interposito rubral. And then it passes through the rubrospinal tract to the spinal cord, anterior motor neuron, and then to the muscles. Now, what does it correct? So it uh, fine-tunes your fine voluntary movement of the distal muscles. So that is for the intermediate zone. Next, we have what we call your lateral hemispheres. So ang tawag naman natin dito is dentato thalamocortical tract. So what is the deep cerebellar nuclei for the lateral hemisphere? We call that dentate. So dentato, thalamocortical tract. So dentate passes through the thalamus, kaya dentato, thalamo, and then to the corticospinal tract. So we call that dentato, thalamo, cortical tract. And then it goes to the motor neuron and to the muscles. So sometimes we think that it's very difficult to understand it. Pero sa totoo lang, madali lang naman siya. Okay, so here we can see the different layers of the cerebellar cortex. We have a granular layer, a Purkinje layer, and a molecular layer. So this is the cerebellar cortex. And there are different layers. Uh, we have the outermost layer going to the innermost layer. We have uh, the deep nuclei. Remember what we mentioned earlier, fastigius, dentate, globus, and emboliform. Or the interpositorubral, or that is the tract, referring to the tract. We have here granule cells. So when you're trying to understand this portion, I would like to... Um, to first, I mean, you have to first try to understand where are these cells located. So we have the granule cells, and then here are the mossy fibers. 
And we have here a deep nuclear cells, a climbing fiber, a Purkinje cell. Okay, so this uh, and um, input from the inferior olive. So we're going to try to understand each of the layers. So let's start off with what we call the molecular layer. And as we see here, it is the outermost layer of the cerebellar cortex. And what does it contain? Um, it contains two types of inter in uh, two types of inhibitory neurons. And what are those inhibitory neurons? We have the stellate and basket cells. So the stellate basket cells are inhibitory neurons. So stellate and basket cells are inhibit inhibitory neurons. What else? It also contains uh, the dendrites of the Purkinje and Golgi type 2 cells and parallel fibers. So these uh, red lines here are your parallel fibers and these are the dendrites of, this is the Purkinje cell and this um, are the dendrites of the Purkinje cell. So it also contains Golgi type 2 cells. So both stellate and basket cells form GABAergic synapses into the Purkinje cell dendrites. Remember, when we say GABA, it is inhibitory. So meaning, um, the cells that the molecular cell contain, which are the stellate and basket cells, they are inhibitory and they form GABAergic synapses with that of the Purkinje cell dendrites. Okay. Now, let's move on to the next layer, which we call your Purkinje layer. So, the Purkinje layer is the middle layer, as we can see here, and it contains the Purkinje cells, this structure here with its dendrite. So, this is the Purkinje cell in the Purkinje cell layer. Now, this cell is very important because it modulates output of cerebellum and it regulates synergy. And take note class, the output is always inhibitory using GABA. Remember, the most common inhibitory neuron is GABA. So the Purkinje cell is a large neuron with many branching extensions. These are called the dendrites. It is found in the cortex of the cerebellum of the brain and it plays a fundamental role in controlling Movement. So that's the reason why it's called Purkinje cell because it was discovered by a Zek physiologist named John Evangelista Purkinje. So remember class, output is always inhibitory and it uses gamma, uh, ga it, it, sorry, it uses GABA. Now, next we have what we call your granular cells. These are found within the granular layer. So granular cells which are found in the granular cell layer of the cortex. The dentate gyrus of the hippocampus and the superficial layer of the dorsal cochlear nucleus, the olfactory bulb, and the cerebral cortex. These are where the granular cells are found. Cerebellar granule cells account for the majority of neurons in the human brain. So these granule cells account for majority of the neurons in the human brain. And there are 500 to 1,000 granule cells for every Purkinje cell and anywhere from 80,000 to 200,000 parallel fibers synapse with each Purkinje cells. So as you can see here, the granular cell layer will send axons. So these granule cells will send their axons to the molecular cell layer where they divide and go a few millimeter in opposite directions to become parallel fibers in the molecular layer. So they soon become parallel fibers in the molecular layer. So now the next portion, which is very important to learn, is what we call your deep nuclear cells. So your deep nuclear cells here receive both excitatory and inhibitory input. So remember, um, there are four deep cere cerebellar nuclei, and from lateral to medial, remember, aning lateral kanina, it's the dentate. So lateral to medial, the dentate, followed by emboliform, globus, and what is in the vermis, it's your fastigi. So the deep cerebellar nuclei are the sole output channel of the cere cerebellum, meaning it's an output channel. Everything that goes out of the cerebellum will pass through the deep nuclear cell. And um, it forms part of the cerebellum 
it, and of closed loops connected to the sensory motor region and the other parts such as the associative cortices and the limbic system. Now, these deep nuclear cells, aside from motor function, it has been suggested that the cerebellum and therefore also the deep nuclei are involved in cognitive and ling linguistic processing as well. So it says na hindi lang siya for motor function but it also is for cognitive and linguistic function. Now, next we have your climbing fibers. So it is represented here. And all climbing fibers originate from the inferior olive, so from the brainstem. So inputs originate from the brainstem. So they are unique. These climbing fibers are unique of uh, the cerebellum as they do not have any homologs elsewhere in the central nervous system. So very unique siya of the cerebellum kasi siya lang ang merong climbing fibers in the different parts of the central nervous system. They originate from the inferior olive. So the inferior olive is found in the medulla oblongata of the brainstem and each Purkinje cell is innerver innervated by one climbing fiber which forms nu numerous synaptic contacts. So every Purkinje cell is innervated by one climbing fiber. So this climbing fiber will send branches to the deep nuclear cells. So meron mo na siyang from the in input from the inferior olive, it will send branch to the deep nuclear cell and uh, before they make their connection with that of the dendrites of the Purkinje cells. So they cause complex spike output. So this is how it is being represented. This is a complex spike output from the Purkinje cells. So that is the climbing fiber. So now we have here the mossy fibers. So andito naman yung mossy fibers natin before the granular cell. And uh, the mossy fiber, as we can see here, it terminates in the granular cell layer and it produces a simple spike output. So here it releases all other afferent input into the cerebellum. So afferent input and send branches to the deep nuclear cells. So take note class that for mossy fiber, they have they are one of the major inputs to the cerebellum and the many sources of this pathway. The largest is the cerebral cortex. So from the cerebral cortex, majority of the inputs passes through the mossy fibers and it sends input to the cerebellum by the, via the ponto cerebellar pathway. So the cortico ponto cerebellar pathway, take note, dito siya sa mossy, dito siya sa mossy fiber dadaan and it will terminate in the granular cells found in the granular cell layer of the cortex. Now, for the deep nuclear activity, we have to, it's important for us to remember that uh, the sole output channel of uh, the cerebellum are the deep nuclear cell activity. So we have here a deep nuclear cell or neuron and it is inhibited or excited. So what inhibits it are Purkinje cell inputs. So it from a Purkinje cell, it gives inhibitory input to that of the deep nuclear neuron and the climbing and mossy fiber input will now, will then, um, on the other hand, give positive or it will stimulate the deep nuclear cell. So the balance is in always in favor or normally in favor of excitation. So merong nag, nag negate meron naman nag -e excite sa electrical activity and then the deep nuclear cell will then send its output which is always in favor of excitation. Okay, so here at the beginning of a motion, so how does a deep nuclear cell work? So at the beginning of a motion, for example, uh, what do you want to do? Basketball na lang ulit. So for example, uh, you want to shoot a ball. So at the beginning of the motion, there will be excitatory signals that will be sent. So this one from mossy and climbing fibers, diba? Going to the deep nuclear cell to enhance the movement. And after which, after milliseconds, some milliseconds, there will be inhibitory signals coming from the Purkinje cell. So this will provide a dumping function to stop movement from overshooting its mark. So pag, for example, nag-shoot ka ng basketball, 
merong pag nagpa-practice ka, may merong nagko-correct. Pag nasobrahan mo yung lakas, so there's a dumping function of the Purkinje cell kasi ninenegate niya or it gives inhibitory signal. So, pag na-perfect mo na, therefore, meaning you have to thank your deep nuclear cell, di ba? Even your Purkinje cell and your in your mossy fibers and climbing fibers. Sabihin mo, di ba, oh, dun sa kakaibigan mo na nag-practice, oy, gumagana na yung Purkinje cell mo, even your mossy cell and climbing fibers, or mossy fibers and climbing fibers. In fairness, ha, ang ganda na ng uh, ginagawa ng deep nuclear cell mo, di ba? So, baka hindi ka niya mag So, anyway, so there is a turn-on and turn-off function. When we say turn on and turn off function, we have here the direct motor pathway via the corticospinal tract. Diba meron tayong um, motor command which is direct? So that is the turn on. It will en- um, it is this is enhanced by the cerebellum by additional signals to the tract or by signals back to the cortex. Remember we said the cerebellum is like a best friend who corrects you. So that is the turn on mechanism. Well, the turn off function, we have here your mossy fiber input also to Purkinje cells. So, here, it activates them after a few milliseconds. So, meron siyang konting delay. And this results to an inhibitory signal to the deep nuclear cell. And it will inhibit the agonist muscle which stops its activity. Okay. So, that is the turn off and turn on function. Now, what is the function of the Purkinje cell to correct motor errors? So, we have here the Purkinje cell. Now, remember the climbing fiber, as we have mentioned earlier, all its input comes from the inferior olive of the medulla oblongata. So, the input adjusts the sensitivity of the Purkinje cell to stimulation by the parallel fiber. So, it will decrease the stimulation coming from the parallel fibers, which will then change the sensitivity of the Purkinje cell to mossy fiber input. So, magkakaroon na rin siya ng decrease... Um, or magkakaroon siya ng long-term sensitivity to that of the inhibitory input from the mossy fiber. So we'll, this will then give a good feedback control of muscle movement. Um, we also have the inferior olivary complex. So from the inferior olivary complex, uh, they will receive input from the corticospinal tract and... Um, Motor centers of the brain stem. So sensory information from the muscles and surrounding tissue detailing the invent the movement that actually occurs. So the muscle spindle and the Golgi tendon will give information to the corticospinal tract via the inferior olivary complex. So we have here uh, the predictive and timing function of the cerebellum, di ba? Timing is very important. Sometimes, uh, kapag wrong timing ka, for example, biniro mo yung classmate mo na wala palang tulog, di ba? Wrong timing yun. Pangit yung magiging effect niya. So, same as that of the cerebellum. So, there, there should be a predictive and timing function. So, the lateral ce- cerebral hemisphere here, located at this portion, it is responsible for the planning and timing of sequential movements. It communicates with the premotor and sensory cortex and the corresponding area of the basal ganglia where the plan originates. Remember, we have mentioned earlier the corticoponto cerebellar tract. Uh, most of its input um, pupunta siya sa lateral zone of the hemisphere because this is involved for the planning and timing of the sequence of movements. Once they receive the plan, it times the sequential events to carry out the planned movement. So that is the function of the lateral cerebral hemisphere. Now, what we're going to discuss next are the different clinical conditions associated with cerebellar dysfunction. We'll start off with ataxia. So as we can see here, um, since the cerebellum is important for not only for balance but also for the coordination of movement, ataxia is uh, being shown on this uh, video. There is a lack of muscle coordination which includes delay in initiation. So makita natin, hirap siya mag-initiate ng movement. Poor execution of movement sequence and you are not able to perform rapid alternating movements. So we call this your dysdiadococcinesia. So dysdiadococcinesia. Parang magandang ipangalan sa anak mo yan, ano? Dysdiadococcinesia. 
Hirap lang sabihin. So, this is ataxia. Next, we also have what we call your intention tremor. So, uh, this is defined as low-frequency tremor. Uh, and its amplitude increases as an extremity approaches the end point of deliberate and visually guided movement. Intention meaning when you perform an action which is voluntary, uh, that, that is where the tremor is being seen. But if it is at rest, um, wala siyang tremor. So that is um, kab yung kabaliktara ng tinatawag natin resting tremor. So this is intention tremor and it is associated with cerebellar dysfunction. So as you can see, when it, he tries to move it, nagkakaroon siya ng tremor. Hindi niya makontrol ito. Now, next we have your cerebellar nystagmus. So, intention tremor of the eyes when trying to fix, fix on an object. So, when you're trying to look at a certain object, nagkakaroon siya ng tremor dun sa eyes niya and we call that your nystagmus. So, um, let me end this uh, lecture on the cerebellar cerebellum and its function for motor control by uh, saying that all signs of cerebellar diseases are always ipsilateral. So, on the same side of the body. Because there is double crossing from the cortex to the pons and back to the cortex. So, because of the um, double crossing, it will only give us an ipsilateral manifestation of the cerebellar diseases. So, uh, that ends our lecture. And since malapit ng Valentine's Day, I'd like to greet everyone a happy Valentine's Day. And as we can see, yan, o, sabi, di ba, pag what's your relationship da, when you are in med school? So, single, married, it's complicated in a relationship in medicine. Yan. I, that's a reminder na mag-aral muna tayo class. Later na yung mga ibang bagay, di ba? So, I'll see you again next time on our next lecture video and thank you so much for listening.